Well, good morning and good new year and everything else that goes with it. We pass an old one by and we enter a new one. Just as uh, in the studies of Galatian, we come to the end of the book and Paul hands over from his scribe and takes over and starts to uh, write those final things himself. And it echoes through those last words that we'll read in a moment, echoes some of the themes that he was on about throughout the, the letter he wrote to the churches in Galatia. So it's Galatians at the end of the chapter, end of the book, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 11. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy are all who follow, to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers we could add sisters. Amen. Interesting. I don't know if you've ever read that book, Paul in Syria. It's by Paul Barnett, a retired bishop from the, an evangelical Anglican bishop from Sydney. And he's very good on background, culture, and stuff of the Bible lands. And in this book, he writes the background of Paul's uh, forming his thinking on the gospel plus nothing. He talks about in the book there, the background, it's a very interesting book if you want to get hold of it from Kurong Books. Paul in Syria and Paul Barnett and so forth. I think they've got, they can get copies in there for anyone who wants to really follow the whole subject through even greater. In the book, he sums up the thing that... Um, Paul's thinking started in Damascus. It went on through into Arabia. And the bulk of his thinking was formulated, he believes, in Tarsus and Cilicia. And later on, when he gets to Antioch and spends two years there, he really had his thinking already set in motion. The issue that he would have faced and the suffering he would have gone through in Tarsus and that area there uh, was because he insisted that Christians did not have to become proselytes and become Jewish Christians. He emphasized the key thing of his whole writing. In fact, a lot of his letters, it comes back to that. It's the gospel plus nothing. Right, the gospel plus nothing. On the grave, and I might have mentioned it before, on the grave of an uncle of mine in Bluff at the south end of New Zealand, there is the saying, he died a young death, this uncle of mine, and it's written on his grave stone. It says, upon a life I never lived, upon a death I did not die, I stake my whole eternity. Upon a life I never lived, that's the righteousness of Christ put to our account. Upon a death I did not die, 
I stake my whole eternity. And Paul would agree with that. And we should agree with that too. But it's very easy for us to add on little things like, you know, you've got to, um, you've got to trust the gospel and be in the brethren. <laughs> I can remember from a young age having the idea, oh, if that group of Christians down the road that don't belong to our assembly, if they were really sold out Christians, they'd be in the brethren. You ever heard that? I can remember it time and time again. It's a subtle way of adding to it. Just like the Jewish Christians we said, you're not a proper Christian. Oh, yes, you might be a, a Gentile Christian, but you're not a proper Christian unless you become a Jewish Christian sort of thing. It's very easy to add. It's easy to add to say, you know, it's the gospel plus baptism. Baptism is something that outlines for us the gospel message personally, but it can't be added to the gospel. The gospel plus speaking in tongues, right? There may be the gift of tongues. That's an issue in its own self. But the thing is, it can't be added to the gospel. Nothing can be added to the gospel. And if we keep that ascended, then we have less arguments and less fights. Most of the fights we have in churches today are around all the peripheral that we insist on adding on to the gospel. You know, if God's at the apex and it's like a triangle, I'm at one corner and somebody else is at the other. If God accepts me and God accepts then, what right have I not to accept across the bottom line? I may not agree, but I have to accept, right? Because God accepts us totally on the basis of the doing and dying of Jesus. Now, as we said from this book here, he traces it back to Paul's formative time, Damascus, Arabia, Antioch, after he'd been in, in 10 years approximately in uh, Tarsus and, and Cilicia. But I, can, I feel we can take it back even one step further, and that is to Stephen, right? Stephen, if you look at what Stephen taught and said and how he saw that the old order had passed away, the temple was of no consequence anymore, and he saw these things and that they were the things that ended up having Saul of Tarsus, having him stoned. I think there's an impression made on Saul's mind by Stephen, because when we look at the writings of Paul, we find an amplification of what Stephen stood for. You're looking into it yourself. I think that Stephen's life and short ministry was not a wasted ministry in martyrdom. It was the beginning, I believe, of getting into the mind of Saul, who got so upset about what Stephen had to say, he had to go and persecute until finally Jesus on the Damascus road appears to Saul and shows him that Stephen was right all along, and so forth. Interesting. Jesus said to the religious people of his day, he said, you search the scriptures because you believe that in them you will find life, but you will not come to me who is life, and the scriptures testify to me, he said. That was because, you see, the religious leaders had that habit of looking into the Bible, looking into their scriptures to find new rules and regulations to load onto everybody. They wanted to have a better New Testament pattern than anybody else's, and they were adding to it little things that people had to do, and they were finding regulations and rules and so forth. The Bereans, on the other hand, they searched the scriptures, didn't they? They searched the scriptures. Why? To find out if what Paul was saying about Jesus in the scriptures was fair dinkum, was true, right? They searched for that, you see? And Jesus on the road to Emmaus, he opened the understanding of the two that were walking by showing to them the things concerning him in the Old Testament, right? So the focus of the Old Testament is not all the other things that are interesting and we can learn by, the main thing of the Old Testament should always be to see those things that point forward to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done. 
Adding to the, the gospel. We've mentioned a couple already. It's easy to do, to put something on to something. Uh, you know, like I know of a church where a woman walked in without a head covering and uh, immediately people were saying, I don't think she's a real Christian, right? You see how subtle it can be? We can judge a situation based on things that we add on, right or wrong, to the gospel. It's the gospel plus nothing. We start there. The other things take second place. Now, take, for instance, uh, we could take false religions and we could see a really big difference between the true gospel and the different things that are often said as a way to God or a way to fulfillment or the way to nirvana or something else. But the, diff the there are subtle differences. The difference between, say, Catholics and Protestants. Okay? Did you know, and for a minute, just put to one side any things you've picked up from people or friends that may be Catholics, right? And people say, oh, Catholics believe you get to heaven by being good. Wrong. They do not, in their theology, believe that they get to heaven by being good. Both Protestants and Catholics start at the same place. It's only by God's grace and God's grace alone that we can ever have a hope of eternity. Yeah, surprising. But it's after that that it differs. All right? You want to check it up, you check it up and see that what I'm saying is fair dinkum. That what happens after that is there are two things. There is Christ for us and there is the Holy Spirit in us. The church up until the Middle Ages had merged the two into one so that Christ's work on the cross atoned for our sin, made the Holy Spirit available. So far, we would agree. But then it was the Holy Spirit working in us to make us into what God wants us to be that became the basis for being with God in eternity. The saying that they have is that so only what comes out of heaven will go back into heaven. They put the emphasis on Christian performance, not just the gospel. It was the gospel plus Christian performance. We call it sanctification. That's the theological word. Dude, they put the emphasis on that. That's why they've got a purgatory. You see, purgatory is not for the unbeliever. Purgatory was for the believer. So that the speeding up process of being cleansed out of sin so that you're made into what God wants you to be to go into heaven. And it's very subtle. And you see, in a lot of our evangelicalism, we can often be a little bit like the Catholics. right? And we can be adding things in that we have to do you know, and we can sort of talk about somehow that it's 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 our Christian walk that makes us stand before God. And there's a little grain of truth there. That's how we get away with it. But really, in essence, we stand before God. And each one of us who knows Jesus stands before God this morning on one basis and one basis alone, the doing, the dying, and the rising of Jesus. There is no other basis. There is no other basis. There is no other basis for true fellowship either, right? As it goes down. You might notice that in the, in the uh, book of Galatians that you've been going through, that Paul subtly changes the emphasis of the Judaizers from being on Moses and the law to Abraham and faith. Did you notice that when you're going through it? You see, the Judaizers focus on the law. And as Christians today, we can often do that. A lot of what our thinking is based on law thinking, judgment and punishment. But Jesus, in John chapter 3, verse 7, he said, I did not come to judge the world, I came to save it. He came not to be a judge, but to be a rescuer. And that's our task. Primarily, as Christians, we are called to be rescuers not judges. That doesn't mean we can't discern and we can't stand up, but we've got to put them in the right order because often today we think we're all called to be John the Baptist. Now, God does call today some people to be a John the Baptist, but he calls us primarily to be like Jesus, right? And the gospel in itself 
means that we become the gospel as well as sharing the gospel. We build a friendship bridge across which we walk as the gospel with the words of the gospel, which means it calls for us to be lamb-like instead of lion-like, right? Because that was what was important to Jesus. We've said it once before, I think. And in the book of Revelation in chapter 5, it's the only time in Scripture where it, it identifies Jesus as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The only time. Right? But in the book of Revelation, Jesus is identified as the Lamb 27 times. He won the victory in chapter 5 of Revelation of the Lamb that was slain. Right? He won by being lamb like. And if we go through his teachings in Mark and the other gospel, we find that consistently the disciples didn't grasp that. They didn't grasp that fact. They were thinking of being great and being made great and, and Israel ruling the world and all that sort of thing. That's what they thought of. That was their concept. And Jesus kept on bringing them back to what he had to do. He was going to suffer and die. He was going to serve not only the Israel, but he was going to serve the world by going to the cross and dying. He was taking the position of a servant, position of the lamb. It was always the way. And that's the gospel. We not only stand before God on the basis of the gospel, but it's the basis of our outworking in God's grace to people around us. It was the faith of Abraham. Abraham's calling was that through him, the nations of the world would be blessed, right? In faith. And when Jesus was here, he... Um, proclaimed the kingdom and of course we see him as the king of the kingdom and yet that king of the kingdom the messiah is the one who is to take the message to the nations but it's the nations in the romans that actually end up crucifying him but in resurrection jesus turns the tables and a whole new covenant is instituted through the resurrection of Jesus. The old covenant has gone away. That's why we have the writer of Hebrews putting it down so plainly for us that the old has been superseded. The best of the old cannot compare with Jesus for who he is and what he has done and so forth. So we, we find a comparison between these two situations the new covenant and i may have said it before because it's very important for us the old covenant was made between god and the people people of israel god said he would do this this and this if they did that that and that and they consistently broke their part of it the old covenant never worked it never worked that's why it had to, had to have a new covenant right the new covenant is not made directly between god and us the believer the new covenant is made between god and our rep who is that jesus you see and jesus said in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will O god have i come and he did it so when we look at jesus you see and when the father looks at jesus he doesn't say, oh, I'm no longer satisfied with who you are and what you've done. You see, the Father is eternally satisfied with the work of Jesus. He's eternally satisfied. It's a covenant which cannot be broken. When we trust Jesus as our Savior, we're in Christ. We're in the new covenant, which has been made for us, a covenant which cannot be broken by our rep, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's taken our place. That leads us into another thing. You know, how does a person get the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit works to change us and make, starts to make us into Jesus people. Not into religious people. Not into Old Testament saints. Not even into John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit's task is to make us like Jesus. He's the Spirit of Jesus. He comes to make us. How do we get it? I mean... At the end of the Gospels and the beginning of Acts there, the disciples are all praying their little hearts out 
in an upper room or something like that until finally the Holy Spirit came. Did the Holy Spirit come because they were tarrying, because they were waiting, because they were pleading, because they were praying? Did the Holy Spirit come as a result of that? Paul in this book, in his letter to Galatians, says it quite clearly. Did you gain the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by doing something? No. It was given as a gift. The Holy Spirit comes as a gift. And that is why we can't, you know, we can let the Holy Spirit have more of us, but we can't gain the Holy Spirit by things that we do that are religious. Right? No matter how earnest we are having all nights of prayer, hoping the Holy Spirit will suddenly give us a new baptism or something, it doesn't necessarily work that way. When we trust God, trust Jesus as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, and then we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and allow him to work in us. But again, as we said before, our standing before God does not rest on how we are becoming more Christ-like as a Christian. It will always rest only on the doing and dying and rising of Jesus. Now, there's another thing. They're talking about, talking about the uh, um, Christ and, uh, and his death, his resurrection. And at the end of this uh, book of Galatians, this letter, Paul brings it out again. You see, we can't keep on killing the old self. You know, we tend to take things wrong as if somehow we've got to really try hard, really try, really try hard to kill the old evil nature. We can't do it. We never could and we never will. You see, what Paul says is that when Christ died, I died. I have died. And what I have to do is keep on daily remembering and putting myself and saying, yes, I really recognize, I remember that. I know that when Christ died, I died, right? When Christ was raised from the dead, I was raised from the dead. I live now in resurrection, joyful life, right? So I should have a smile on my face and wear a polka dot shirt to church. And, you know, there's a time for being grave, a time for being serious. That's true, particularly when we remember the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. But we're not called to be drab. We're not called to walk around with a long face like we're sucking on a sour lemon and to be, you know, wearing dark clothes as if we're at a funeral. As we said once before, people outside, they don't like going to funerals. They go kicking and screaming when you drag them by the scruff of the neck to go to a funeral. They go because they often have to go, but they'd rather be somewhere else because it's a really sad time to be at a funeral. Shelly and I know that. We've had about four funerals in the last few months of family members and friends and others. It's, you know, people don't want to be there, but they're there because they know they have to be there out of respect for the person who's passed away. But you see, if you have a party, you know, if you have a party, and Jesus seemed to go to a lot of parties, he went to wedding parties, right? Okay, he wasn't against parties. If we have a party spirit, in that sense, not the party that Paul was talking against, but, you know, a fun time spirit. If we've got that, it attracts people. You know, people want to gate crash a party. They don't want to gate crash a funeral, right? So it's the same way. And so we need to live in resurrection life. And isn't that what baptism is all about? Isn't that what baptism is all about? Isn't that what it is? It should remind us that we have died with the Lord Jesus because he died for us and we have died with him. We've got to keep on reckoning on that when problems face us. We'll never, ever be free of our sinful natures this side of eternity right we recognize that that's why we stand before god on the basis of his grace and his grace alone there is no other basis to stand before his grace declared in the finished work of jesus his grace towards us daily his saving grace his living grace and his dying grace so those sort of things that are there for us all the time Where does that leave us then? It leaves us thinking and concentrating on the most important thing, isn't it? That's why the Lord left us the communion time. 
or the, the Lord's Supper or the breaking of bread, whatever name, Eucharist, whatever you want to call it by. He left that with us so that we would continually be remembered, reminded of what is the focus and the important thing that we should be focusing on. And that's on who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us, the gospel. And that's what Paul was bringing out. Look, it doesn't matter whether you have short hair, long hair, or whether you have uh, your circumcised or non-circumcised, or you got this. It's certain cultural things people do, and that was okay for the Jews. It became cultural for them. But to think that doing that adds to the gospel, you've got to trust Jesus, you say, and do this. No, there can never be that. Yeah, if you want to speak in tongues, that's different. But the point is, don't put it on with the gospel and say, oh, if I don't speak in tongues, I haven't got the spirit. If I haven't got the spirit, then I'm not really saved. It's a lot of thinking that the revival centers come on to with that sort of question. It goes into that. You see, those things might have their place, and we don't want to get into discussions on that. The thing is that we stand only on the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And that gospel is wrapped up in him who is the saviour and the Lord and so forth. His live, the live, life that he lived, the death that he died, and his resurrection, right? And they're ours. That's the important thing. That's why we celebrate the communion. That's why we do that. That little old hymn, I'll finish off with that, that we often sing, you know, that one day it's called, you know, old favorite one uh, some of us might know younger folk don't, don't often know but there's a lot of wonderful i like some of the modern hymns i really do some of the boppy ones i really like them but the thing is that there are a lot of really good theological things in the old hymns right and sometimes we forget that you know that one that says the chorus says living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, a glorious day. It's all about Jesus, isn't it? Right? And if that's where we center on, I find in industry and in talking with guys, that's where I center. They don't talk about you know, where there are things that are going on around us. We know all these things are happening unless someone wants to talk about it. But it's to talk about Jesus, who he was, why he was different. You know, working with Asian folk, I'll talk about Jesus was an Asian. He is. He was West Asia. Palestine is West Asia. Jesus wasn't a white European. He didn't have blonde hair and blue eyes and all that sort of thing. You know, we, you know, we, we work in with people wherever they happen to be. But it's important to focus on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace let's pray father we just thank you and praise you for the lord jesus this morning and we ask that you might help us to keep on refocusing 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 on him and who he is and what he's done remembering what was important to him has to be an important to us and we just thank you and praise you in his wonderful name amen